We've been talking about heaven in this series, and this is something that has always fascinated me. Even as a little kid, I was always wondering, like, what comes after this life? I don't know why. I just, just always have. And as I think about it, I think back to Tom and Jerry, the cartoon Tom and Jerry. See, every day before school, we would eat breakfast. We'd watch those old cartoons from the 1950s. You got Bugs Bunny, Tom and Jerry, Sylvester and Tweety. And if you're not familiar, Tom is this cat that chases Jerry, who's a mouse. And the whole cartoon is about how Tom chases Jerry and Jerry goes away from Tom every time and Tom gets hurt somehow and everybody laughs. And so, look, there was this one episode where Tom actually dies, okay? And it was freaky. I mean, there were years of cartoons where Tom was electrocuted, he was drowned, he was pounded into the ground, swallowed by dogs. I mean, he's been through it all. But in this one episode, Tom finally dies. And it was weird. We were all like, wait, he's dead? I mean, this is supposed to be a cartoon. This is like trauma material, okay? So, so check this out, okay? This actually is the actual cartoon that I was watching one morning. A, t- a piano has just fallen on Tom, just to catch you up here a little bit. And then Tom is dead. Now look, as you see, the spirit comes out of his body and it gets on an escalator and the escalator takes him up to heaven. You see clouds, you see other spirits, all kinds of other cats are coming to heaven and everyone has to report into the desk clerk and he is at the pearly gates and he has this book and he's gonna look through whether you're good enough to get in. I mean, it's a classic scene and it represents what our culture has pieced together over the centuries. Now. Here is what Tom and Jerry reinforced to me when you are dead as a kid. And I'm sure it's something that we can all relate with. First, heaven is far away, okay? It is up there in the sky, some far off place, far off from where we are right now. Heaven is up there. It doesn't have to be the actual clouds, but it's in the sky. It's far away. Okay, so number two, heaven is dreamlike. It's all dreamy. You know, it's like this idyllic environment. Everything you've ever dreamed of is up there. There's all this light. There's dreamy music. If you could have heard a little bit of the cartoon, there's this like, you know, like violins and harps and stuff like that. Okay, so that's the second thing. Third thing, it's based on your deeds. Okay, so there's someone who weighs out our deeds, evaluates whether we've been good or bad, like your actions are weighed in a balance, which is not the truth, okay? We know, we've been talking about this in our series, is that it's all about what Jesus did for us, not what we do, but cartoon heaven has good deeds getting you in. So number four, heaven is where we retire. And then the fourth thing is really interesting here is that if we're good enough, we spend forever in like a spa, you know, a country club, someplace we go to rest and just let it all go. So it's funny. Obviously, we got different ideas about heaven, but you have to admit that this is a general direction that most of us have when we were growing up. We kind of had this general thought, you go up far away, there's a tunnel of light, lots of loved ones, you do whatever you want, whatever it is, there's this dreamy sense of being there and then, okay? And when I say there and then, I mean far from our perspective, even far away, some point in the future, out there somewhere. And one of the more interesting things is that heaven is this place we go that represents a sort of leaving it all behind, like resting, like we go off to this retirement village somewhere. So I want you to know, okay, that's kind of what we've all accumulated in the back of our consciousness of like what heaven is. If you're comfortable with that, if you prefer cartoon heaven, Please don't read anything Jesus has to say about heaven because it'll mess you up. I mean, it'll seriously mess you up. Jesus had a much different idea about heaven. For example, at the beginning of his ministry, Jesus shows up in Galilee and he starts preaching. And this is what he says. He says, look, the time promised by God has come at last. The kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. So now let's think about this for a minute. I always thought, according to cartoon theology, that heaven is this faraway place. You know, it's someplace there and then. But Jesus keeps talking about it like it's nearby. Now, quick note, when Jesus talks about the kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven, he's talking about what we talk about when we talk about heaven. It's where you go when you die. And, but it's like a little bit more, but we'll talk about that later. But here are a couple other examples of where Jesus continually talks about heaven like it's here and now. So Jesus is arguing with one of the religious leaders, and he says, if I'm casting out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has arrived among you. Interesting. Fast forward to Luke chapter 10. In Luke chapter 10, we see Jesus talking to his disciples, and he says this, when you go out, tell them the kingdom of God is near you now. Now, it seems like Jesus is talking about a heaven that is present, here and now, and that sounds like a lot 
of a different place, then heaven is this dreamy place where everything is all about you and resting and putting your feet up. Even the religious leaders of Jesus' day were confused about what he was saying about heaven. Being asked by one of the Pharisees about the kingdom of God, he answers them like this. He says, hey, the kingdom of God can't be detected by visible signs. You won't be able to say, here it is. Oh, there it is. For the kingdom of God is already among you. See, do you see why this can be a little bit confusing? So as people argued about what Jesus was talking about, some proposed that maybe Jesus is talking figuratively, maybe it's symbolically, like the kingdom of heaven represents a group of people or a particular mindset or just like a way of thinking. But Jesus talked about heaven as a very real place. It's like Jesus had this bigger vision of how heaven is an actual place, a physical place. And this place is pursuing our reality. It's like overtaking it. It's absorbing it. Now, you got to understand, it's almost like there's this blob from eternity that's going to absorb us. Look at Matthew chapter 11. This is how Jesus talks about this. Matthew chapter 11, verse 12, it says, and from the time John the Baptist began preaching until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing. It has been forcefully advancing and violent people are attacking it. So Jesus has this idea of the kingdom of God overtaking this world, not setting up some alternative reality somewhere. So you see what I mean? Jesus had a much different take on heaven and it had to do with the bigger story of God. See, I wonder sometimes if we get confused about heaven because we make it all about us. I mean, come on, let's face it. When we talk about heaven, We talk about what it means for us, for our story, what happens when we die, what's gonna happen in our eternal destiny, which isn't a bad question to ask. But you gotta remember is that our story factors into the whole. You have to remember there's there's a whole different story out there that we actually plunge into, not vice versa. This is not about us. There's a much bigger story that we find ourselves in. And I wanna tell you this story. It is the story of Jesus. This is what Jesus would have been thinking about when he thinks of heaven. It's the story of the blob of heaven, God's presence invading our space, this bigger story. And hopefully it will help you make a little bit more sense of what Jesus is talking about when he talks about heaven. So as I tell you this story, I wanna borrow an idea from Tim Mackey and the Bible Project. If you've ever heard of the Bible Project, if you got a pen in front of you, whatever you got, nail polish, whatever, just write on your hand, I don't care, but write down Bible Project. Google it, go to YouTube, the Bible Project with Tim Mackey. It's great, great stuff. You will learn a ton of stuff, great resource. But I love how he sets this up, so I wanna borrow this idea from him a little bit. I wanna tell you, this is currently how we think of heaven. We think of it, we've got like earth over here, we've got heaven over there, and it's interesting. At some point at the end of this life, this is how we currently think of it. If we put our trust in Jesus, we'll make the jump from earth to heaven, right? So again, that's how we currently think of it. Now I wanna kinda give you the story of where Jesus is coming from when he thinks of heaven, and it's so different. And it starts with creation. At creation, heaven and earth are in the same exact place. Okay, see how those two circles overlapped? This was the design from the first, that God would be face to face with his creation. Genesis talks about God creating everything and it was good and his presence was among them. And there was no death, there was no disease, there was no decay, we had a purpose for living and God was face to face. In fact, Genesis 3.8 says, when the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking in the garden. And this is more than just poetry. It's not just a nice idea. Now, I don't know if God has legs. I don't know what the whole idea is of God coming and taking the form of a person, but it matters that God was there. His presence was among us, okay? This wasn't a cartoon. This wasn't just like a nice idea. He was actually present. But see, the story takes this radical shift when as people we decided that we want our own way, okay? We separated from the presence of God. We pushed out of that circle and we established our own circle, which puts us in crisis. It changes everything because heaven is wherever God is. Now think about this for a minute. Heaven is wherever God is. God is life. He's like the battery that lights us up. Everything from the fullness of our soul to the health of our very bodies runs on the presence of God. He is life. And so when we wanted to determine what is right and wrong for ourselves, that's when sin entered the picture. And that leads to death. It's where death and decay and disease all come from. It is the system with no battery. 
no life-giving force. And Romans, Romans chapter five says this, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. So there's a linkage there between that separation and death. And you know what? God could have let us die off, but he's not like that. It's God's character to rescue and save. And so that's what he did in the person of Jesus. So we see then, if we're looking at this, see where the heaven and earth come a little bit closer. God draws near. He chased and caught up to it. That's why Jesus kept using the language of how heaven is coming near. It's the son or daughter that walks away and the father that goes after them and wraps them in a big hug. That is where the kingdom of God shows up in the ministry of Jesus. You see that overlapping section there? In that overlapping section, that's wherever Jesus interacted with us in his earthly ministry. Whenever Jesus healed someone, he was restoring what was found at the Garden of Eden. Whenever Jesus spoke truth, whenever he delivered people from their demons or raised people from the dead, it was like an artist going through his own gallery and erasing graffiti from all of his masterpieces and saying, I wanna put this right again. So again, I'm referring to a guy named Paul. He was an early follower of Jesus, and he wrote letters to all the early churches. Paul talks about it this way. In Romans chapter five, verse 18, it says, yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone, but Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life for everyone. Yeah. New life is the signature of God's presence in our lives. And I love that God leads to newness, but that's not the end of the story. See, sometimes we stop here and we make it all about us. Man, we got new life in Christ, great, awesome. I am redeemed, awesome. But we forget the last part of the story. The last part is God coming back to us face to face. It's like the father that's saying, I just want our family to be together again. And so it doesn't end with us going to heaven. It ends with heaven coming to us. So you say, so when is this happening? This happens at the judgment. There will be a day where God enters human history. And it will be at the end of human history, the history of sin. God will move back in. And these circles will overlap again like it was from the start. God will bring restoration to everything. We'll return to the original design for which God created us. See, so God did not create some separate heaven for us to retreat to like a country club or retirement village. That doesn't work, people. Think about it. You spend the rest of eternity in in some kind of disembodied place where you float around on the clouds and down here is on earth that God created and it just turns to junk, then Satan wins. Sin and death win. It's a retreat from sin and death. It's a loss. No, I love that God remains undefeated. At the end of time, God steps back into our space, into our world. He throws a couple elbows. He gets rid of sin and death and disease and decay. And God will judge sin and death and he will expel sin and death from this world. And this is the point in which the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of earth will overlap again and there will be no difference. The book of Revelation talks about how the dwelling place of God will be among his people. Look at what the Bible says. God gave John the disciple kind of a sneak peek of what happens at the end of time. He says this, and I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne. I heard a loud shout from the throne. It's not from the person on the throne. It's from the person right around the throne, kind of like a herald, and he's saying this. Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And then it says this, this is so cool. And the one sitting on the throne, and now it changes to God's voice. And you know what God says? He says, look, I'm making everything new. It's that new language again. Do you see what this is all about? God steps back into our space, just like he was present at Eden. It's like God's gonna bring back Eden to this earth. 
But this time, it is so much better because now it's people from every tongue, every tribe, every nation, and God brings heaven to this earth. God is in the middle of a plan of restoration, a plan to bring heaven back to earth, and that's the story. Now you know it. Do you see how when Jesus is talking about how uh, heaven is this thing that's happening, it's like there's momentum, there's energy, there's intention behind history. It's not about us getting our escape ticket up to heaven when we die. It's about heaven coming to us. And this is real. It's not some dreamlike existence. It's not a retreat from this world. I wonder if some ways we will look back on this life and think, boy, that felt like a dream, because that will be more real. I mean, in case you missed it, God brings us a city You know when it says that a city came down? When the Bible introduces a city, that means a functioning city. You and I have places to live, things to do, economy, jobs. This is real life. I don't want to live in a country club forever in the sky. I want heaven that has its eyes on something bigger than my personal wish fulfillment. And so does God. And see, here's the thing. I really want you to get this. There was a point for your existence at the beginning of time. At the beginning of time, when God created mankind uh, in the Garden of Eden, he didn't imagine, he didn't imagine uh, and create us for, for us to float through the garden and just do whatever we want, uh, eat ice cream for breakfast and all that kind of stuff. He didn't create us for this country club life. He said, take care of the garden. Work it. Take care of everything I've given you. Be fruitful. Multiply. See, God gave us purpose, something to do. And we've been derailed from that purpose because of sin. I mean, think of this. This is trippy. All of human history is this massive detour of sin. We have just been in the business of overcoming sin and getting right with God. And in heaven, we get to return to the original design and purpose for which we've been created. I mean, there's something exciting about that. What is that? What are we going to be doing? And I have no idea what it is. I wish I did. But I know whatever God has planned for us, I know it's a whole lot bigger than just sitting on a mountain somewhere, strumming a harp and eating grapes and a toga. See, that's what restoration is all about. Getting back to the original vision and the dream of God. And this is what 1 Corinthians says. Paul, again, he's talking here and he quotes from Isaiah. He says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. It's going to be big, people. It's going to be amazing. So look, heaven is not a finish line. It's the starting point. Isn't that amazing? Do you see why when we talk about heaven, we gotta talk about the whole story? We don't start with you. We don't start with me. We start with God. We start with heaven because it all starts with heaven and it ends with heaven. And if that's true, listen to me. That's what we're gonna talk about now. It changes everything in your life here and now. If all that happens next, you gotta see this, that what happens next changes your now. It's got to. Yep, you know, heaven for most of us is going to be something that happens a while from now. It literally is then and there, okay? But there's another side of that coin because eternity, if it really is eternity, then it should have an effect on this life. I mean, think of the dot that we live in right now, this little dot. And when you consider all of eternity, okay, here's the dot, here's all of eternity. It's like a ray that goes out in this direction forever. I mean, like past New Jersey, past Idaho, it just keeps going. It's forever in that direction. If you trust Jesus and you're sitting here in this dot, then everything here has an effect on everything here. See, Paul talks about this when he talks about living in the not yet. Paul, again, as an early follower of Jesus, he's trying to help the other churches kind of figure out what all this is about. And he reminds them, he says, look, there's a bigger story here. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, he says, but we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we are eagerly awaiting for him to return as a savior. Now listen, I want to remind you something. Eagerly awaiting does not mean we are just sitting on our hands. Eagerly waiting means we're eagerly acting like it. So it's a perspective change. It changes how we move. We start acting like citizens of a country that is on the way. So I'm asking today for a perspective change, that we stop thinking of heaven as a place we get a ticket to, and more of heaven as a place we get our passport from. And it should change the way we live today. It is who we are, not where we're going. So, look, we've all had experience with this idea of living in the not yet, okay? If you're a senior in high school, I know what this is all about. You know, 
Some of you guys have already been accepted to colleges. Some of you guys have lined up training for the trade that you're going into. I bet a few of you, I'll be gentle, have developed a little senioritis. Mom, dad, is it right? Yeah. You're so done with high school, right? But you're not there yet, but you're already living in it. You know, we all understand that. When you get engaged, it's the same thing. When you get engaged, you just act differently to the opposite sex. You got to kind of like pull back a little bit because now you're engaged. When you're expecting a baby, everything changes, okay? You know, the way you eat, the way you sleep, the way you eat. You get a little cranky. You get a little nervous. You start living in the reality that's not yet. We all have experience with living in the reality that's not yet. When in, in the summertime, my family, we, we'd go to the shore in the summer. Every year, my family would load up the car. We would head to Ocean City for the summer. And I mean, like for the whole summer, we would leave behind my entire life. It was like dying and going to heaven. It was amazing, okay? So I had a job there. I had friends there. I had family there. I could go to the beach every day. I could ride my bike on the boardwalk. And I couldn't wait to leave my life of school and spend my summer of freedom in Jersey. Who knew that Jersey was heaven, you know? <laughs> But you know, the trip was two hours, and two hours having to wait is like a lifetime for a kid. And of course, my parents would stop at the grocery store. Stop stopping at the grocery store. We'll, like, eat something there. Just like, let's get there. But somewhere about two miles away, I would roll down the window, and that's how we did it back then. And it would come down, and I would start smelling that salt air. Oh, and my mom would say, honey, do you smell that salt air? I'm like, yeah, I do. I smell it. I'm there. And suddenly, it didn't matter whether my... My brother's foot was on my side of the seat. Like, I didn't even care about that anymore. I wasn't impatient anymore. I was a different person. And I wasn't even there yet. Because I could smell it. It changed who I was just from my perspective. See, the problem is that too many of us get caught up. We forget that we live here, but our citizenship is in heaven. And I see a lot of people living like they lost their passport. I see a lot of people who say they put their trust in Jesus, but they've forgotten what's coming. And you know, I understand, it's not a big deal. It's easy to lose your perspective, but you need a reminder. You know, we've got all kinds of people who come to church on the weekend and they have all these feelings of hope and assurance and then Monday morning comes around, you got problems and you got pressures and you got pains and all of a sudden you just lost sight of the fact that this is just a page in the bigger story. Do you remember about 10 years ago when Christians lost their minds about the color of a coffee cup? Do you remember that? Starbucks, instead of putting a Christmas tree on the coffee cup, now it's just like red, and all of a sudden there's this huge social media campaign, and it was like, Starbucks hates Christians, okay? So that was an internet sensation. That stuff happens. We lose our perspective on social media. But you know what? I think the stuff we've really got to watch out is more, much more personal than that. You don't, you, you got to imagine, there are so many people that lose perspective interpersonally. You know, you don't talk to that person that was your friend, and it was something they said to you, so you can't forgive them, so you shun them. And you've arranged it so that you can't have it fixed. No one can fix it. And you aren't even open to talking with them about it. You know people like that? Maybe that's you. You know, my mom was really good at that. She didn't talk to her sisters for 15 years. She lost perspective. She lost perspective of what's coming. See, the story is so much bigger than this. Don't let one page determine your whole story. Start talking to them again. Pursue peace. Stop the shunning. See, I talked to someone who was ready to quit their job over something super minor because they felt they were disrespected by a coworker. Man, you lost your perspective, man. You know, there have been lots of people over the last few years that have lost their ever-living mind over just about everything. We have lost perspective. Because heaven is on the way, it should change the way you live today. These things are just pages in the bigger story. Hey, you know, having said that, I just want to break out for a minute here, and I want to talk to you if you're not a Christian. Because I'm sure what I've just talked about has affected you in a huge way. Someone who claimed to be a Christian has been a total jerk to you. They've forgotten who they are. And deep down, you know there's a difference between what Jesus came to offer and how that person treated you. You know that there's a real thing. And then there's the way that you were hurt by them who claim to be a Christian. And I just want to be honest with you. I want to call a spade a spade. Sometimes people decide to put their trust in Jesus so that they can get their ticket to heaven. 
And they're not interested in the passport from Christ. They are not interested in how it changes you in the here and now. And the ironic thing, listen to me, I'm talking to you. The ironic thing in the midst of all this is that you suffering from this exchange is that you are the one who is more interested in how Jesus might change someone's here and now than they are. It's like you get Jesus more than they do. So, You listen to Christians talk about there and then and heaven and glory and all that stuff and preachers preach about getting saved and being lost. And you know, you hear all that and you think to yourself, I don't really have a deep sense of feeling eternally lost, but man, I'm lost right now. I mean, you don't care as much about heaven and hell as much as you care about what to do this week. I want you to listen to me. The whole idea of heaven isn't some escape hatch. It's not some spiritual trap door. Jesus said that he came so that we might actually live here and now. In John chapter 10, he talks about this. He says, I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. So I'm speaking to you. Jesus came so that we might be more fully human right here, right now. And I think you get that. And I think you could really benefit from hearing more about what he has to offer you as a human right here, right now. And look, if that's you, we got a number you can text to get more information. I know this sounds totally corny, but if you text TRUST to 20022 right now, take out your phone, just do it. I don't care who's watching. I just want you to get some more information on something that's real. I mean, think about it. If Christians have turned you off then turn to Jesus instead. Get the real thing. Forget the fake thing. In fact, the only way you know it's the fake thing is you know that there's something real and it's out there. And look, it doesn't mean you've made any major decision. You're not going to be asked to stand up or anything like that. It doesn't mean that we're going to show you, uh, you're actually going to show up at your door and say, thank you for making this decision or anything like that. It doesn't even mean you have to be here next week. It just means you're interested in finding out more about following Jesus and that can make a difference in your life. You see, it's all about perspective. I think of it like this. If eternity is happening and the kingdom of God is advancing, then all of this gets reinterpreted. I want you to listen to me. So this is for everyone now. Your career, your relationships, your status in other people's eyes. Hey, listen, your beauty, your worth. Oh man, I need whiter teeth. I need poutier lips, more well-defined abs, garbage. How much is all of that in the light of eternity? See, we forget this perspective, but we need to keep reminding people, hey, 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 this is just a page in the bigger story. In fact, for many people, that could be like a full-time job. Hey, it's just a page. Turn the page, bro. There's a bigger story. I say this all the time. We can keep one eye on eternity And one eye on our lives, if we just keep looking back at our own lives, if you just think about your own experience. Do you remember seventh grade? Do you remember how awkward you were? Remember how you didn't have a clue? How things back then seemed so overwhelming. And now you look back on them and you're like, oh, you don't have a clue about overwhelming little seventh grade me. If only I could go back. That little seventh grade you didn't know anything about pressure or problems or pain, right? They didn't know anything. If you could go back to, to, to seventh grade right now with everything you got up here, you would crush seventh grade. Now, I mean, we're all laughing, but look, that's you from eternity to right now. Your eternity you is looking back on you and saying, turn the page, bro. See, I remember ninth grade, walking in on a rainy morning. I just put my stuff in my locker. Can you imagine me, a ninth grader, you know? I put my stuff in my locker. I'm walking on my way to homeroom. It was a rainy, rainy, rainy Monday morning. And I was in East High School in Westchester, PA. And as I'm walking along, I'm feeling all good, heading to homeroom. And all of a sudden, I just felt this presence. And I locked up. It was girl presence. (laughs) It was Heather Godshaw. Captain of the cheerleaders, blonde hair, beautiful. She's standing next to me and I'm walking. I'm like, <gasps> I'm telling you, it's just, you know, ninth grade guys, just, just happens, okay? It's just perfume, all of it, you know? She's bouncing along. She's like, hi, John, how's your morning? And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> no joke. I just turned to her and I go, rain. I had no clue what to say. You know what I'm talking about, right? I see a couple guys out there like, yeah, I've been there. (laughs) 
You know, I'm sure she had that effect on a lot of ninth graders. Man, if I could go back with what's up here right now and know that I married someone so much more pretty. Anyway, um, I would go back and I would be like, you know, I got to say that. I got to say that. <laughs> so I would, I would go back and, and I'd be her friend. I would talk to her. I wouldn't be so nervous, you know. I, I, would, I would actually pay attention in class, you know. I would understand my parents a little bit better. I would look at the very real pains and pressures and problems of every ninth grader, but I would also see the bigger story. I would know there's a future for me, that I have real friends one day. Man, you know what? That's just what every high schooler wants, just real friends. Friends that initiate. You know, they send the first text. They're the ones who invite you to something. Someone who listens. So can I talk to my high school friends here for a second? You're going to get there. You will have friends. And you'll get friends that get you. They walk alongside of you. They don't give up. They keep going. If you just hold on, you will have those friends. And see, that's the voice and the perspective of eternity. There is so much. I would go back to ninth grade John and tell him, See, here's the question. If heaven's coming for us, then it ought to have the same effect as you from the future saying, hey, this is just a page. You're part of the bigger story. Live as a citizen of heaven. So I guess what I'm saying here is that there is someone who stepped out of heaven and he came to us and he told us that heaven's coming and that this reality should change the way we move through our lives. Hey, look, I know some of you are dealing with some serious issues right now. You're dealing with health issues, marriage issues. There are people in your lives that are making things really difficult for you right now. But it's a page. There's a bigger story. Paul said it like this, and I love this. If you can save this on your phone, write this down somewhere, memorize it. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long. Yet they produce for us A glory that vastly outweighs them all and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on the things that cannot be seen. So this came, listen, this came from a guy who was about to be executed. He knew that this was even part of a bigger story. So look, if you've already decided to follow Jesus and there are things going on in your life that make you feel lost, that have you overwhelmed, the pain, the pressure, the problems, and they're huge and you can't fix them all, maybe right now it's a good reminder to back up and get some perspective because pressure and stress and feeling lost can make you do some unwise things. You know that. So listen to me. It's just a page. Remember that you're part of a bigger story and we are only on this earth for a blink And there will be a day you look back on this time and you'll think, man, why didn't I remember the big picture? If you've trusted Jesus, you're from another country, you're a citizen of this thing that is coming but is not yet, and that changes a lot, how you view yourself, how you treat other people, how you care for the people in your life. You don't get to that point. I don't want you to get to that point in eternity where you look back on all this and you wonder, why didn't I care about the people around me? Why didn't I reach out to the people I work with? Why couldn't I get out of my own head? There are a hundred different things that perspective like this might drive you towards.